Throughout history, science and technology has been a vital element in maintaining the defence and security of civilizations. And technology is more relevant today than ever before. NATO, since it was founded, has relied upon a technological advantage when it comes to their weapon systems in order to secure our nations and defend against threats. We do not want to fight a war where the number of airplanes and tanks and ships are the decisive factor. We want to be superior to our adversaries in order to save our own warfighters' lives and also to deter any aggression. As we speak, this advantage or this edge is eroding because we see our adversaries are investing more and more in science and technology. They are approaching fast and we have to also step up our game. Hungarian-born Dr. Theodor von Karman can be considered as the founding father of the NATO Science and Technology Organization. He was to aeronautics what Einstein was to physics. For von Karman, the creation of NATO came at an opportune moment to re-establish post-war international collaboration. He thought, why not use NATO as a pilot plant to test out the feasibility of scientific cooperation? Focusing initially on the domain of aeronautics and aerospace, in 1952, he created the Advisory Group for Aeronautical, later to become Aerospace, Research and Development, or AGARD. 1954 saw AGARD being fully integrated into NATO. Some years later, the Defence Research Group was created to undertake research outside of aerospace. In 1997, AGARD and the DRG merged to form the Research and Technology Organisation. In 2012, this was later expanded to include dedicated maritime research, and the group became the Science and Technology Organization, or STO, as it's known today. Through the Science and Technology Organization, nations have built a growing international community of more than 5,000 world-class scientists, engineers, and military operators from more than 40 NATO and partner nations, working on over 300 research projects. This is known as the Collaborative Programme of Work. The idea is that if there are a number of scientists in different NATO nations working more or less on the same problem, we remind them about the other ones in the NATO nations doing the same thing and invite them to work together. And that's why I also say it's more like a dating service, uh, bringing people together with, with the same interests, with the same problems, and hopefully they can then make more together than they could achieve by themselves. The Science and Technology Organization is giving a particular focus to emerging and disruptive technologies. These are technologies that are making a particular effect in military operations now and into the future. These emerging and disruptive technologies are space, big data, biotechnology, hypersonics, quantum, autonomy, novel materials and artificial intelligence. These technologies are the focus of a lot of NATO activity, both understanding the science and also understanding some of the legal, ethical and moral implications of the use of these technologies. There are three executive bodies that fall under the NATO Science and Technology Organization. There's the Office of the Chief Scientist, which is located at NATO HQ in Brussels, the Centre for Maritime Research and Experimentation in La Spezia and the Collaboration Support Office in Paris. The CSO manages the collaborative programme of work which is undertaken by seven different technical teams. There's Applied Vehicle Technology, Human Factors and Medicine, Information Systems and Technology, Systems Analysis and Studies, Systems Concepts and Integration, Sensors and Electronics and modelling and simulation. It's the largest defence scientific network that there is in the world. And this collaborative programme of work delivers all the science and technology that is needed by the Allies and partners to deliver their defence and security needs. 
And in addition to the sharing of the knowledge, they also get access to world-class test facilities. Also testing and data from different environments, from the Arctic to the desert, from the undersea to space in a way that no nation can do by themselves. The idea is to multiply the investments in science and technology research and development in the different nations. And we know that the United Kingdom say that for every pound they put into the science and technology organization collaboration, their own estimate is that they get tenfold back, which is quite extraordinary. So it's sharing knowledge and sharing the results. A war today involves a lot of technology. And if you have technological dominance, you will win the war. The Science and Technology Organization's mission is to empower NATO's technological edge and further strengthen the alliance. I have no doubt that the nations will be looking carefully at the geopolitical situation that we now face and reflecting on how their own national research priorities need to evolve and therefore how the collaborative programme of work will need to evolve into the future. In my opinion, we have what I would call a Sputnik moment, referring to the shockwaves the Soviet Union sent into the West back in 1957 when they launched the Sputnik satellite. It might be as obvious today as it was back then, but I think we are in more or less the same situation and we have to act on this and it's urgent.